from the thick swirling blanket of early morning fog that had surrounded the quiet Prussian town of Jena emerged the legendary Grand Army and its fearless leader, Napoleon Bonaparte. They had clearly attained the element of surprise and were situated in and around the southeast plateau of the Sale River, about to unleash the final death blow to the Holy Roman Empire. Was Napoleon aware of the historical importance of that moment? As he watched the last wisps of fog slowly unveil his target, did Napoleon see his destiny unfold before him? It is true that he must have foresaw the end of an empire, that was indeed his goal. But to envision how his actions over the next several hours would have implications on world history spanning centuries surely would have proven as difficult as seeing through the Sale River Valley fog. History shows that through previous victories at Ulm and Austerlitz, Napoleon and his Grand Army had quickly become one of the most feared military forces in world history. But surely, no one present that day would have known the full implications that Bonaparte's victories at Jena and Auerstadt would inspire. But having the benefit of over 200 years of hindsight, we do. Enough time has passed following Napoleon's reign to clearly see just how the French victories over the Prussian army and the subsequent end of the Holy Roman Empire signaled a significant turn in human history. The repercussions not only echoed throughout Europe, but they reached the shores of North America and continue to reverberate through Western culture, even today. Indeed, these swift French victories signaled the rise of Napoleon, but they also would serve to inspire the defeated Prussians. Following the losses at Jena and Auerstadt, it had become clear to the Prussian people that if they wanted to preserve their lineage and their culture, a drastic change would be needed. The collective Prussian esteem had been staggered. Napoleon was now occupying Berlin and the Germanic lineage was in danger of sinking into an abyss, and Johann Fichte's addresses to the German nation seemed to be the perfect antidote. Fichte's famous works inspired a rejuvenation of national pride that culminated in a reformation calling for an entirely new order of things, not only in the tactics of the Prussian military, but in the methods of government, economics, and the emergence of a modern pedagogy. Fichte's addresses to the German nation were presented at the Great Hall at the Academy of Sciences in Berlin to overflowing audiences during the winter of 1807. And they, as Freiherr von Stein wrote, had a great effect upon the feelings of the cultivated class. It is certain that the addresses were a powerful factor in the creation of that national spirit, which appeared for the first time in the War of Liberation of 1813 to 1815. As we will soon see, Fichte's addresses had enormous historical significance, not only on the fate of Germany, but on the fate of human history itself. And while the true impact cannot be easily quantified within the constraints of this presentation, we can turn to Seeley's description of Fichte's addresses for some context of their historical importance. Seeley writing that the prophetical or canonical book, which announces and explains a great transition in modern Europe, and the prophecies of which began to be fulfilled immediately after its publication. Fichte's addresses also heavily influenced linguist and philosopher Wilhelm von Humboldt to such a degree 
that he hired Fichte as professor of philosophy at the new University of Berlin in 1810. Humboldt is largely credited with the creation of modern German schooling through his Humboldtian education ideal, and it's hard if not impossible to make a cogent argument denying that Fichte had a massive influence on Humboldt and the development of a universal Prussian education system. Especially when you consider the declaration that Ebert made to the German people at the opening of the National Assembly at Weimar, reported in the Times on February 8, 1919. In this way we will set to work our great aim before us, to maintain the right of the German nation, to lay the foundation in Germany for a strong democracy, and to bring it to achievement with the true social spirit and in the socialistic way. Thus we will realize that which Fichte has given to the German nation as its task. We want to establish a state of justice and truthfulness founded on the equality of all humanity. This task that Ebert speaks of, born from a socialist ideal that Fichte had set before the German nation, was the beginning of German National Socialism, and its goals can be plainly seen when one reads his addresses. And when we look to our present-day North American compulsory education system for comparison, the two are shocking in their similarities. Fichte writing on page 20, that the free will in the pupil is the first mistake of the old system and the cleat confession of its impotence and futility. The new education must consist in essentially this, that it completely destroys freedom of will in the soil, which it undertakes to cultivate and produces on the contrary strict necessity in the decision of the will, the opposite being impossible. Such a will can henceforth be relied on with confidence and certainty. Here we see for the first time the true aims of Fichte, primary citations that prove his true motivations and intentions. His goal written, in his very own words, was the standardization of the human, to remove the free will of the German citizen, to destroy freedom of will in the soil, to mold each citizen into a predictable automaton, and to immerse them into a new collective by systematically taking their individuality. A new strict national policy of obedience and servitude to the state in the name of preserving the Aryan nation and the means by which he would achieve this were, in the opinion of the narrator, highly suspect to say the least. Fichte wrote a series of, well, it was over a dozen public essays to the Prussian king from let's say, let me say, 1808 to about 1818. They're called Addresses to the German Nation. And the provocative event that set the first one off was the Prussian army, which was the Prussian economy, renting soldiers, stealing other people's stuff, had been whipped by Napoleon's amateur army at the Battle of Jena in 1806. Fichte said we have to set up a system of forced schooling, universal forced schooling, in which we destroy the imagination. And by destroying freedom of will in the soil, Fichte means to remove individuality at its earliest stage. Like stepping upon a seed that still has not pushed through the dirt to reach for the sun, Fichte aimed to remove individuality of the human even prior to childhood. Reformation of the German education system, as well as the eradication of the traditional role of family, would become his primary initiatives. Fichte aimed to remove the individual's power of the senses at an early age, literally molding the consciousness of a nation. And by persuading the public to believe that their sense of touch, smell, sight, hearing, and gut instincts are unimportant in the pursuit of the truth, he is creating a nation of miseries dependent on the judgment of authority. He aimed to remove any dissenting voice and nullify the ability to question the government's actions 
two important qualities of a free and open society. But these efforts to stifle also render the investigative or inquisitive or exploratory nature of the human insignificant. Without our senses, we can no longer ask the who, what, where, when, why, and how. Essentially what we see is the elimination of the trivium method, an education dating back to the origins of Western civilization that emphasized personal enlightenment through the convergence of three forms of knowledge, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Fichte's universal education stood diametrically opposed to the trivium's cultivation of individuality, while diminishing the importance of any other proposed education, as seen here by his attack on Pestalozzi's argument for homeschooling. Pestalozzi's book for mothers contains the foundation of his development of all knowledge, for, among other things, he relies heavily on home education. First of all, so far as this home education itself is concerned, we have certainly no desire to quarrel with him over the hopes that he forms of mother. But, so far as our higher conception of a national education is concerned, we are firmly convinced that, especially among the working class, it could not have either begun, continued, or ended in the parents' house, not, indeed, without the complete separation of the children from them. This also is one of the absolute and indispensable conditions of the realization of our scheme. We have seen enough of what will happen if mankind as a whole repeats itself in each successive generation as it was in the previous one. If its complete reformation is intended, it must once and for all be entirely separated from itself and cut off altogether from its old life. Not until a generation has passed through the new education can the question be considered as to what part of the national education shall be entrusted to the home. Fichte admits that Pestalozzi's emphasis on the importance of homeschooling cannot be quarreled with. He agrees that the role of the mother, and in turn the family, is important in the development of a child, but then indicates his intention on completely removing the family's responsibility to the education of their own children replacing it with the authority of the state. Government becomes the new guardian under a new national interest. And it is here we see another stark similarity to our own Western compulsory schooling, a state-controlled education system. In fact, Fichte also states that for the general German citizen, Reading and writing should be one of the last things they are taught, so as to save them from delving into further subjects of enlightenment that he believed were beyond their understanding. However, a human without the use of their senses, coupled with the inability to read and write, dissuades them from understanding their true surroundings. It literally strips them of their consciousness, removing the one thing that separates us from other animals on the evolutionary ladder. For Fichte, a populace within an awareness would be a direct threat to the insidious power of a corrupted state. He goes on to surmise that for the German scholar, those determined to be worthy of a post-secondary education would be given the ability to read and write immediately and used for the purpose of furthering into the hearts of the public a sense of eternal love for the fatherland. Here Fichte's intentions are clear the development of a guardian class, and once again we seem to be looking directly into a mirror as we peer into the origins of a deliberate restructuring of German society, the image of our own Western society is being reflected back. This creation of a second tier of social class, of supposed intellects, authority figures consisting of doctors, lawyers, and teachers that Noam Chomsky rightfully theorizes is made up of roughly 20% of society that needs to be the most heavily indoctrinated, for they will be useful tools complicit in maintaining this corrupted form. When we talk about manufacturing of consent, whose consent is being manufactured? 
we, we can to start with there are two different groups we can get more into more detail but at the first level of approximation there's two targets for propaganda one is what's sometimes called the political class there's maybe 20 percent of the population which is relatively educated more or less articulate uh, that plays some kind of role in decision making uh, they're supposed to sort of participate in social life either as managers or cultural managers like say teachers and writers and so on they're supposed to vote they're supposed to play some role in the way economic and political and cultural life goes on now their consent is crucial it's one group that has to be deeply indoctrinated then there's maybe 80 percent of the population uh, whose main function is to follow orders and not to think, you know, and not to pay attention to anything. And they're the ones who usually pay the cost. All right. While one may have reservations regarding Chomsky, upon further scrutiny, one is hard pressed to find a reasonable argument to oppose his two tier system of indoctrination theory and it seems to speak to Fichte's intentions for universal education in which Fichte's addresses serve as the primary source material. All who get through only the universal national education are intended for the working classes and training them to be good workmen is undoubtedly part of their education. Hitherto the state has had to do a great deal and yet has never been able to do enough for law and police institutions. Convict prisons and reformatories have caused it expense. Finally, the more that was spent on poorhouses, the more likely they were required. Indeed, under the prevailing circumstances, they seem to be institutions for making people poor. In a state which makes the new education universal, the former will be greatly reduced, the latter will vanish entirely. Early discipline is a guarantee against the need in later years of reformation and penal discipline, which are very doubtful measures, while in a nation so trained, there are no poor at all. To further emphasize Fichte's influence, the Prussian Reformation took place in the years immediately following Fichte's addresses to the German nation, and roughly coincided with the period between the Prussian losses at Jena and Auerstadt in 1806, with the Prussians' eventual victory over Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Certainly many changes continued even into the 1820s, but for the most part, the sweeping societal changes all took place roughly within this 10-year time period, largely inspired by Fichte's call to nationalism. Wilhelm von Humboldt was the key figure in the reformation of Prussian education, and in particular the development of the research university. He was put in charge of the Department of Religion and Education within the Ministry of Interior in 1810. Under Humboldt's influence, Prussia's education system would be standardized. Instead of the plethora of religious, private, municipal, and corporate educational institutions that had previously existed, the new system would be streamlined into three tiers, the Volkschule, the gymnasiums, and universities. The entire system would be mandatory, strictly enforced by the state, and would be one of the world's very first tax-funded, state-controlled, compulsory public education systems for all girls and boys from the age of five to 14. The first of these three tiers was meant for the majority, and was an eight-year course of primary education that was called Volkschulen, or the People's School. It provided for the basic reading and writing skills that were becoming a prerequisite for any student entering the modern labor force, while also supplementing his or her development through the addition of culture with classes in music, as well as Christian teachings meant to keep students disciplined. It was essentially a school that trained students for employment in vocational or trade jobs. The second tier was called real school, roughly equivalent to secondary school, 
It was where a student would be introduced to more advanced concepts in mathematics and physics. It acted as a preparatory school for the university level of education. Those that excelled here would have a chance at the next level of learning, but the process was heavily administered by the centralized power of the government. The third tier was the university. Humboldt's ideal of autonomous world citizens connected through the Welt Bürgertum, or a cosmopolitan understanding that was directed exclusively to those students that had reached the university level. Students who were able to attend university would be taught beyond the level of the first two tiers of technical or vocational education, and those obtaining this knowledge would also be contained within their own framework of bureaucracy. They were introduced to a system in which dissent from the consensus would mean the loss of social status, or if one persisted enough, the eventual destruction of their career. Humboldt built a system in which students of this higher education were taught to think similarly, and Berlin University would be the model. In the end, the shortcomings of Humboldt's system are paralleled by what we are witnessing here in North America today. Exorbitant tuition that strictly limits the lower and middle classes from the most important knowledge, and a system that invigorates the creation of a caste system that controls independent thought or free thinkers. The 19th century in the United States was an era of extreme flux. While the Prussians were fighting in Europe for the preservation of their nation in the lead up to the Battle of Waterloo and the Austro-Prussian Civil War, so too were those across the Atlantic in the United States. While the War of 1812 had finally freed American interests from the control of British power early in the century, massive European immigration, the assimilation of desegregation, the introduction of the Industrial Revolution and the American Civil War led to much strife in the middle of the century. All of these societal conditions combined with the addition of the labor wars, the farm wars, the Indian wars, and the reformation of American education and medical systems promised a tumultuous conclusion to the century. Progressivism was sweeping America and the old traditions and ways of life would not succumb easily. By the middle of the 19th century, the home of the brave and land of the free was already being deeply compromised by men like Edward Everett, Horace Mann, and Calvin E. Stowe. Later, the torch of reformation was passed to men like the early oil, steel, and banking elites of John D. Rockefeller Sr., Andrew Carnegie, and George Peabody, who were keenly interested in implementing a factory-style education model like the Germans were using successfully to create an obedient working class. And understandably, there was vehement opposition to this progressivism throughout America. As a 17-year-old, Edward Everett would graduate from Harvard as its valedictorian, later serving as its president. Around the time he turned 21, a fresh-faced Everett began a four-year sojourn abroad, where he was introduced to Wilhelm von Humboldt and was immediately impressed with the Prussian education system. Everett would receive the first PhD given to an American while at the world's initial research university at Goddington and would develop a certain affinity for German culture, ultimately combining this appreciation with his influence as the 15th governor of Massachusetts by laying the initial groundwork for the integration into the United States of the Prussian education model, instituting normal schools for the training of teachers, and creating a state board of education in 1837, assigning Horace Mann as its first secretary. Horace Mann traveled to Prussia in 1843 to see firsthand the factory model of public schooling being instituted there. 
impressed he must have been, as he immediately submitted to the Boston School Committee a glowing report of his transatlantic voyage that helped push for legislation that would have the United States government adopt the Prussian model. And in 1852, he was instrumental in its implementation, first in Massachusetts, and made mandatory by Edward Everett. In Mann's seventh report to the Boston School Committee in 1843, he claimed that the only way to get kids into school was to force them, with mandatory attendance, administered by the state. He claimed the Prussian model to be the finest in the world, and if the United States wished to catch up, they would be wise to allow the government to become the primary parent. Mann believed it to be beneficial also in the policing of young children, that it would serve as a way of combining Christian ethics with democratic values. And like Fichte, Hall claimed the common school approach would be the cure for a changing nation. It would eliminate most crime and aristocratic privilege while assimilating immigrants into loyal, Americanized patriots. Calvin Ellis Stowe became an important advocate for public schools in the U.S. western frontier following a visit to Prussia on official appointment from the Ohio State Legislature in 1836. Like Mann and Everett, upon his return, he published a report advocating for state-controlled education like the one he had witnessed in Prussia. It is of little surprise that the Ohio State Legislature then recommended the prompt dissemination of Stowe's Report on Education in Europe to each of the state's 8,500 school districts, as well as to several other states. As we can clearly see, there is a direct connection between German National Socialism and the Western public schooling system. This failing factory model of bells, regimented schedules, mandatory attendance, limited subject matter, and destruction of the individual originate from the corrupted mind of Johann Fichte, someone who would inspire a young Adolf Hitler and the rise of the Third Reich over 100 years later. Coinciding with the adoption of the Prussian school system across North America, there was also a movement emanating from renowned Prussian universities like Leipzig that promoted a new experimental approach to psychology. This would lead to psychology being considered a legitimate field of scientific study alongside already well-established academic fields as a true science. In the next episode, we will cover how this factory-style education system and a burgeoning psychology industry would combine into a two-pronged assault upon the minds of the youth all made possible through the funding from rich American philanthropic organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Endowment for World Peace, and the George Peabody Foundation. And it is mainly through the financial influence of these three philanthropists that our compulsory universal education system was first introduced to North America. Join me for the next episode of The History of Propaganda when we detail, with primary source material and historical fact, just how an oil baron from Cleveland, a Scottish-born steel and railroad tycoon, and a British-American financier used their social esteem to dominate government officials on the county, state, and federal levels to enforce the widest-ranging example of propaganda that the Western world has ever witnessed. <laughs>